Welcome, everybody, to the How Therapy Works version of our Q&A series with my dear buddy, Jer on Air. I appreciate all of you being here and watching these videos. The support that you've shown for all the ones we've done up until this point has been awesome, so it has motivated us to continue doing it. We're both excited about today's topic because I think it's one that if we can put a bunch of good information in one place, it gives people a really awesome resource for getting information that can sometimes be really hard to get. So I'm going to introduce myself, and then I'm going to have Jared introduce himself. And as we do with all of these, Jared's going to be the moderator and in control of the questions, and I will answer them. So uh, I think it's important for this video in particular, if you haven't met me before, to introduce myself as I'm Dr. Mick. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in Illinois and in Nevada. I have a PhD in human development with a specialization in marriage and family therapy. And I am the co-owner with my wife of a therapy practice called Starline Therapy. And we serve people online in both Illinois and Nevada. We've been in operation for almost three years. I have worked in a variety of different contexts as a therapist. I've worked in grad school clinics. I have worked in a, a group practice as somebody who was like one of the subordinates. I have worked in a hybrid educational and therapy practice, and I now own my own practice. I've done therapy online and in person, and I have been a therapist. I've been doing therapy for over 10 years at this point. So I've got lots and lots and lots of experience with this stuff to be able to answer these questions. I also was a, I am a approved supervisor and I have worked in training contexts as well with therapists who are learning to become therapists and who are not yet licensed. So uh, pretty good stuff. So that's where I'm coming from in my answers to these questions. I'll be speaking from my professional experience. I'll be speaking from things that I have learned from other folks, things I've bared witness to, uh, using examples from my own practice in terms of some of the administrative stuff. As always, I don't talk about my clients on these videos, but I can talk about some of the other aspects of what it is to be a therapist and all of that. So that's where I'm coming from on this. I'm gonna let Jared introduce himself and then we're gonna get rolling. Uh, yeah, I'm Jared. Uh, I have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. Uh, so I have a little bit different background than Ryan because I have not been able to practice as much since graduating, which is something that I'm trying to change. So a lot of my experience comes from being in a program uh, and doing like an internship uh, and, you know, writing a paper to summarize all the work that I did throughout therapy. So I'm much, much more on the junior side. I've never been a supervisor. Uh, or anything like that. So I do have time in the room, but I, you know, don't have kind of the, I guess the advanced slash later development of a therapist as you will. And I definitely don't own a practice. Uh, so a lot of that stuff I will be defaulting uh, to Ryan on in terms of uh, questions uh, and whatnot. But I do still know what it is like to be in the room. I do still have a lot of experience dealing with like different types of diagnoses and stuff like that um so i do have a little bit to offer and also uh i don't know what your favorite class in your program was but um uh micro counseling was by far my favorite class so i always love to kind of micro counseling yeah, dude. Yeah. Nice. We did not have yeah. that class. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, it was basically just about like all of the minor interactions and stuff that go on between like a therapist and the client. And that's just, great. Like, and on all that. Oh, baby. I loved it. That's it great. I wish ever. we I wish we would have had that. Like, that's what I wanted to teach if I had finished uh, our PhD program for sure. I also just had like an amazing teacher. I think that helped a lot. She just made me like love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, there's uh, there's my intro. Sweet deal. All right, let's make it happen. You ready to go? Let me throw I'm this ready, man. Up there. Throw it at me. All right. It's going up there. You got to tell me because there's a delay. Yeah, I know. I can see it basically immediately All right, when you put cool. it up. So you're good. What is a service agreement and what should I look for in one? 
So this is a really important starting question because this is a document that if you see a therapist of any type, and I'm talking about actual, uh, like professional mental health professionals. So anybody with a license that's actually bound by like the state and somebody who has a code of ethics, uh, meaning I'm basically life coaches don't count for this Q and A. I just want to make sure that I put that out there. Um, the service agreement is the document that sh tells you essentially as the client what you can expect from your therapist. So what you can expect to pay, what the expectations around things like scheduling are, what the limits of confidentiality are, uh, what you can expect in terms of like cancellation policy, uh, referrals, like all that kind of stuff. Like there's any, every service agreement for every practice looks different. So it's not like it's this one unified document that every single therapist uses. Uh, different practices have different policies. It is your point of reference for really anything administrative that happens in your therapy. And it is crucial that you actually read it. Uh, you should read every single word of your service agreement and anything that you do not understand in the service agreement, you should ask your therapist around about. And if your therapist does not give you a satisfactory answer for clarification purposes of the document, that is a huge red flag. So this is things like sometimes people wonder, uh, are you who can you tell about what we talk about in therapy? That kind of information will be disclosed. So for example, if you're seeing somebody who is not yet licensed, but works at a group practice under supervision of a licensed therapist, that licensed therapist that they're working under has access to your case files and is likely consulting with that therapist about your case. And your identifying information will be known by that supervising therapist because they're the ones that are legally responsible for your case, despite the fact that the intern or associate is seeing you. So that should be in your service agreement. That will be there. Like in my practice, we have a separate document for associates versus licensed therapists to indicate that so that you know what you're signing on to. If you see a therapist at a uh, graduate school, for example, that kind of thing is going to be in your service agreement. You're going to see that. So those types of things that are unique to your specific experience are going to be written up in that document. As far as I have ever known, that document is not a negotiable document. So that is basically your therapist saying, this is what you agree to by seeing me. So if there's anything in that service agreement that doesn't feel right for you or that you don't like, and you ask a question for clarification purposes and you don't like the answer or it just doesn't feel right for you, you can seek therapy elsewhere. You are not obligated to sign a service agreement just because you are uh, just because it was handed to you. However, when you do sign the service agreement, you become the client of the person whose service agreement you signed. And that's incredibly important because at that point in time, that therapist is now responsible for you. So if you sign a service agreement and then bail, your therapist is going to try to get a hold of you and contact you because they're responsible for you as your client. So never sign that service agreement until you feel satisfied in what it is that you have read through and you've had that discussion with your therapist and you know what you're getting into. They're not designed to like mess with people or anything like that. It's not it's not designed to have subtext that you don't understand. It's not a bunch of legalese. It's literally just the, the contract essentially that you're signing with your therapist for how to handle the administrative aspects of your therapy. So it's, it's so important that you read that. And I generally recommend that you ask a therapist if they are willing to do a consultation with you prior to signing a service agreement. Usually they're like 15 minutes to a half hour and they're usually free. It's a chance for you to get a feel for them, to check vibes, all that kind of thing. And if the vibes are good and you feel great about what that person could potentially offer you, it's not a therapy session, then it can sometimes make it easier to sign the service agreement because then you're not locked into having to pay for that first session and all of that stuff. So that's what a service agreement is. What you should look out for is just making sure that you understand it. You should make sure that it's clear, 
that it outlines everything that you think is important as it relates to your therapy. So like what happens if I cancel a session within 24 hours? What happens if I no show? What happens in the case of an emergency? What are your fees? What am I expected to do if my insurance doesn't work? All of that kind of stuff is gonna be up in the service agreement. Yeah, I'd say the only other thing you might wanna look for, and this is more if you're going to like a training facility or whatever, is just, uh, a lot of them will record sessions yep. uh and yeah, if they that's do a good record one. sessions then that has to be in the service agreement and like uh how they record sessions who has access to the recordings how long the recordings exist for and stuff like that um i mean it's like never anything nefarious you know uh but a lot of the times at least in my experience like those recordings are used for therapist development so yep. like i might say oh i was having trouble uh, with the client like talking about this topic um, could we like go over the conversation and see if there's anything I missed or how I could approach it differently uh, and all of those stayed securely within the training facility but that is something that you still want to be aware of I don't really I mean I don't know if you do but I don't really know many therapists that do record after like no. grad school uh, too much but work. It, yeah it also isn't like impossible to do so it's just good for you to look out for something like that yeah and uh to add to that because this is a common question actually um you will not be recorded unless you know you're being recorded like sometimes yeah. people are afraid that their therapist is recording their sessions without their knowledge if your therapist does that that's a fast ticket to losing your license uh the other thing that you should know about recording is that uh you also should not record your sessions because if you do that you're essentially in possession of materials that are not being stored in a HIPAA compliant kind of way. And if you lose those sessions or whatever, like that's on you, it's not on your therapist. Uh, so if you have any interest in somehow recording your sessions, you need to have a conversation with your therapist about that. Sometimes clients will ask about that because they're like, oh, I want to remember what we talked about in therapy or whatever. That's more complicated than you might think. So um, make sure that you have a conversation with your therapist about that if it's something that you are uh, interested in uh, potentially getting access to. And uh, just to kind of piggyback off that, because I forgot to drag this above it, but what sort of training do therapists undergo and how long do they train for? So it very much depends on the discipline that a therapist goes into, but generally what you can expect from an LPC, LMFT, LCSW is they usually are going to have gone through a two-year master's program, at least two years. Some are two and a half, some are three. It really it depends. Like I know UNLV is two and a half. Northwestern where I went was two. I don't know what Oregon was. Was it two? Oregon was two, yeah, for okay. just the MFT, yeah. Okay. So usually they will have a master's degree. Uh, that's, usually, that's considered to be the terminal degree. And what that means is that that's the degree that you need in order to practice on your own and achieve licensure. A PhD is not required in order to be a therapist. It's just a bonus that usually a person undergoes to be able to teach in the academic sphere or do research. Uh, that, so that training, that includes also, I mean, there's also your undergrad. So in order to go to grad school, you have to have graduated with an undergraduate degree. So your therapist didn't necessarily have to have like a psychology degree for their undergrad. I knew people who went into their master's program for therapy that did nothing related to psychology prior to becoming a therapist. They might have to take a few prerequisite courses in order to fit that criteria for entry to a master's program. But you can expect that that person has a master's degree. If you're in, if you're seeing a therapist that's in a training program, they are in that program. They don't have the degree, but that can actually be a really good experience too, because they're getting active supervision and they're learning on the fly. And it, usually, the number one referrals for students are people who saw students. So don't be afraid to look at that as an option. But we go through a pretty significant training in terms of learning about ethics, learning training uh, treatment models. Uh, different types of interventions, how to assess, uh, in our case, how to assess both individually and systemically with multiple people in the room. You learn different like special problems in populations. You'll learn um, a lot. Of, there's a lot of what's called self of the therapist work that happens. So like if you want to go to school to be a welder, you have to learn how to use a welder as your tool. Well, as a therapist, our tool is ourselves. 
So we have to learn how to use ourselves in a professional and proper way and how to manage all the stuff that comes along with being a therapist. A lot of times we get asked, how do you manage all the heartache that you have to see every day? And when people talk about their traumas, how do you not let that affect you? It's because we were trained on how to work through that stuff. We're trained on what is going to come up for us. Where are our transferences likely or counter transferences likely to come from? All, that is all the work of a master's program. We write a lot of papers about our own lived experience, trying to connect that to the work that we're doing in the room. It's very involved. It's why people like Jared and I get frustrated when we see things like life coaches who don't have that kind of training because that type of training is so important to us to being able to deliver that service to you in a meaningful way where it doesn't become about us, it's about you. So that's really the bulk of what our training is over the course of that two years. And it's pretty rigorous and intense because it's two years to learn how to enter a profession that is always evolving just by virtue of the fact that you're working with humans. And then after you graduate, uh, for MFTs in particular, you are usually looking about two years of gaining clinical experience before you can actually get your license. Sometimes many more. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you're able to get a job immediately and hammer it out, it's, you, it's at least two years. You never see people usually get a license before the two year threshold, uh, unless a state allows that. But that usually requires like several hundred more hours on top of what you got in your master's program of actually doing therapy. I started my master's program in September 2012, and I started seeing clients November 2012. So we started seeing clients almost immediately when I was in my master's program because the whole philosophy was that you learn by doing. And there are other programs that make you wait a year. Uh, I don't know what Oregon did, but I know like UNLV made uh, students wait a year. I waited but, a year. But we're doing therapy while we're in school so that we actually learn the craft. And then we have to compile more hours afterwards to show that we're, and you, that gets signed off on by a supervisor and all this other stuff so that you're shown to be competent to be able to practice on your own. So it's a very elaborate training process for us to be able to do what we do. There was something else you said that I was gonna mention, can't remember. Oh, uh, I was going to note that uh, on the topic of um, people in your like program. Yeah, like I was I was in my cohort with uh, well, not my cohort, the cohort above me with I think he was the head of the history department at the time, but he wanted to be a therapist. So he basically like taught all day and then went to class afterwards. Um, so like you don't you don't need to have a background in psychology, though I would argue it helps quite a bit. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Especially uh, in terms of like the programs looking at you as a potential candidate. Um, but no, there's usually nothing in there that says you have to have a prerequisite. Um, it's, oh, yeah, this is going to say the program in my eyes is, a, is supposed to work essentially as gatekeeping, though I will yep. say not every program is accomplishes that and also some people have a way of getting around it but basically it's supposed to be a way of saying this is what you have to do to be a therapist and if that's not for you that's fine but it lets you know that like yes you are going to be dealing with other people's very very intense trauma so if that is not something that you are up for you should probably not be a therapist like you're going to be dealing with a lot of clients on your caseload at one time so if, you know juggling all that stuff is not uh, something for you then that's fine but you know you shouldn't be a therapist um so that is honestly the point of uh like at least master's programs in my eyes uh and i feel like the master's programs should be three years i remember thinking about that when yeah. i was in it but most of them are about a two yeah but you oh man because they're two years you see so many clients uh <laughs> when you start to see clients like you started pretty quick i waited a year I think I waited like six months to uh, actually see therapy in the room. Like, I think I did like six months of really intense like training and knowledge. And then I started to shadow somebody. And then I just like literally one day I was like, all right, cool. Your shadow is done. See you in the room. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it was intense. We were thrown in pretty. We had a class my first quarter that way. And we were on the quarter system at Northwestern. We had a class our first quarter that was 
called, uh, oh, what was it called? Uh, Pre-Practicum. And it was like really focused mm -hmm. on all of that stuff. And then we like learned all the basic skills about like how to do a phone call and all this stuff. And then then you were assigned your supervisor. And then the second half of your pre-practicum that first quarter was you getting your first clients and doing the live interviews and all that stuff. So it's uh, the other thing that I would say just before we move on to the next question is that a, a training program, one of the things I used to say to my students and supervisees all the time is that as a therapist, you should never be averse to doing your own work on the things you're going to ask your clients to do work on. So being in a training program is really about having to confront some of your own stuff and really understand some of what makes you tick and where you're coming coming from. And when students were averse to that kind of work, it's understandable to an extent because it's hard work. It's not easy, but also you have to push through that. Because if you're not going to evaluate the way trauma, for example, affects your own life, the idea of you going in and asking clients to evaluate the way trauma affects their lives is, in my opinion, ridiculous. So that kind of training is super important for you to understand. Also, people ask this all the time. You are not required to go to therapy as part of your training. You can't require people to go to therapy, but it is highly encouraged that therapists go to therapy while they are in graduate school or you know if you went before that's cool too so that you can get a feel for what it's like to be on the other side of the room and have that experience because sometimes it's easier to empathize with what a client might be experiencing when you've been there yourself and i i don't think it's a red flag if a therapist has never gone to therapy i think it's a red flag if a therapist says they never will go to therapy that would be a mm. huge red flag but yeah, if that'd it, be weird it would be very weird. I, Unfortunately, I've met one person in my life that was like, no, nah, I'll never go to therapy. And I was like, okay, well, you'll never be referred to then by me because that's a huge yikes. But for the most part, most, I mean, every other therapist I've known has either gone or has said, yeah, if I needed to go, I would absolutely go. So. Um, did you have to, like, I don't want to ask this question. I, guess I have a story that I want to tell. So I want to know what is your most interesting experience of like training outside of your like classes in your practicum that you had to do? Like, did you ever have to go to like uh, an AA meeting or anything like that? Yeah, we for our substance abuse class, we had to do that. Um, we had to either go to an AA or an NA meeting. And I yeah. went with my I went with my roommate and um that was a that was a really fascinating experience. I wouldn't say that that was my most interesting one outside of my traditional training, although trying to think about what that answer would actually be is a bit hard right now. Um, you can tell mine, your story and that my job yeah, mine. Mine was uh, uh, we it was for diverse uh, counseling, diverse populations, uh, which I don't know if you had a, a class. Similar yeah, we to did that or not. Yep. OK, um, I had to like go and talk to somebody with a background different than myself and get to know them and learn more about them so that I could like have an idea of just what it was like to be them. And then we basically reported back on that. And so I actually got to go uh, to a synagogue and talk to a rabbi and I talked to him for like two hours and I just got to like learn all about Judaism and stuff like that. And it was awesome. Actually that, you know what you say, my, I won't go into the long story on this cause it's a long story, but I, uh, in that class for us, we had to have a, uh, we had to immerse ourselves in an experience that was something that we had never considered mm. experiencing before. Um, and I posed as a homeless person in millennium station in Chicago for about five and a half hours and played my guitar with my case open to like, see if people would give me money for it. And that was a very wild experience. People like arced around me and like would not look at me. And I got yelled at by the cops and like, it was, cra oh man, it was, that was a crazy experience. So um, my, I, not that I didn't have it before, but my empathy for folks who are like homeless or who are trying to like perform on the street in order to make ends meet went up astronomically after doing that. It was unbelievable to have that experience. I wrote down my other question. Um, should I look for someone with a PhD instead because they are better at therapy than somebody no. with a master's? No, a PhD doesn't tell you anything about a person's uh, ability to do clinical work. It is an indicator that they might have some degree of expertise, that they went to school for an extra period of time. Perhaps they have some teaching experience, but a PhD in no way, shape or form 
is an indicator that a person is a better practitioner than somebody with a master's? That's actually a really good question because people will sometimes actively seek me out because I have a PhD and that's fine, but it's not really a piece of criteria that you should be considering when you're looking for a therapist. Unless you have like a very specific issue, like let's say that you're like experiencing um, like PMDD, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Like, let's say you're just, you're dealing with that, and there's a person in your area who has a PhD who did their uh, like their research expertise is in PMDD. Totally, go go see that person. Like that that is a perfectly reasonable time to do that. We had a colleague who's like the foremost expert in families that are raised by grandparents. So like, if you're a grandparent who is working or like who ha is taking care of your grandchildren as your children, essentially like she would be a great person to go see clinically in that area if you were there. So like that would be the one time that I would say that that's worth considering. But on the whole, a PhD doesn't tell you anything about whether a person's a good therapist or not. Awesome. All right, next question. Is there a benefit to attending only a few sessions like around one to five? Yes, depending on what the issue is. So this question is, I think, an important one, too. There's so many good ones in this because they're, these are some of the most common questions we get. The number of sessions is not something that you should be thinking about as an indicator of whether your therapy is going to be useful to you or not. Now, I say that with the caveat of understanding that some employee assistance programs or EAPs will only give you a set number of sessions with a therapist, or perhaps you only have a budget that allows you to afford a certain number of that is a perfectly reasonable thing to take into account. But if we're talking about conventional circumstances, depending on the issue that you bring to therapy, there are some models of therapy that would say that five sessions is too much. Uh, so uh, there are others that would say you couldn't possibly get to know a person's issues within the one to five. So it really depends on what your goals are. It depends very much on what your, how willing you are to do some of the quote unquote, like hard work and really push yourself into that space. Some people need to build a relationship with their therapist first, and that takes time. Uh, the average length of my caseload right now at the time of making this video is just over three years. So I have a lot of clients that I've been seeing for a long time, um, some, is, some for over five years. But I have had many clients over the course of my career that I saw for let's call it anywhere from five to 10 sessions, and we terminated successfully because they got what they needed out of the experience. So don't think about it so much as how many sessions do I need to go to in order to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish. Ask yourself, what am I trying to get from the therapeutic experience? And what is, what is the thing that I'm trying to accomplish? If I need a relationship with my therapist and I really need to build trust with this person before I go there, so to speak, that's fine. That's gonna take you a bit more time because we're talking about an hour a week. Uh, sometimes you can go more than once a week. It just depends on your needs. But sometimes it's hundreds of sessions over many years. Sometimes it's therapy for two months and then you take a year off and then you go back for another six months. It, there's no hard and fast rule for what you're supposed to do in terms of your session frequency. But is there a benefit to it? There absolutely can be. I always argue that some therapy is better than no therapy if you're thinking that it's something that you could benefit from. So it really just kind of comes down to your subjective experience and what you're needing. Um, how long do sessions tend to last? In general, you can expect sessions to be either 45 or 50 minutes. It depends on what the practice is standard is it also depends on if like if you're using your insurance it depends on which length insurance is willing to reimburse uh, so for example there's an insurance company in nevada that won't reimburse 50 minute sessions they'll reimburse 45s so you got to do 45 minute sessions but generally you can expect 50 minutes now sometimes people are like wait a second but why isn't it an hour the 10 minutes at the end of that session is for a couple things one it's for your therapist to do their notes uh, because every if therapists have to take notes, it is it's part of the gig. Those notes are not shared with anybody. The only time those notes are ever shared is if they're subpoenaed, and that is super rare that your case notes would ever get subpoenaed. Sometimes uh, insurance companies will audit case files, but they even that they won't generally ask for case notes because uh, they're not they're for the therapist more than they are anything else. 
for us to remember what we talked about, what we did, so that we can reference them later on if we need to say like, oh God, what did we talk about a month ago? So we can keep your, so that you don't have to keep repeating yourself every week. Uh, but essentially, your therapist will take notes. They'll do their notes during that portion of time. And then they'll usually, like I know I use it to get up and walk around and get like a drink of water and reset myself so that I'm good to go for the next session because going all the way up to the hour and then immediately starting the next session can be very jarring and it's it's not you don't get a chance to clear your head before you walk in and be present with the next person, particularly if you have like vastly different needs on your caseload. Like coming out of a session with like a family of six and then immediately seeing an individual who has like a really deep trauma history that's doing really hard work can be just like, oh my gosh. So 50 minutes is generally what you can expect. There is what's called a diagnostic clinical evaluation, which is usually the first one to three sessions that you will be billed for. If this is really matters more if you're using insurance, the 9071 code, that's billed at 90 minutes. But that's because your therapist has to develop what's called a treatment plan and an assessment. And that takes extra time for us to do. The thing that I think a lot of people don't generally understand about what a therapist does is like you are you take more time than the 50 minutes we're in the room with you. That's not a bad thing. But on average, I would say each client I see, including their session, probably accounts for about an hour and 20 minutes of my time every week if I take into account like notes and thinking through what we're gonna talk about potentially in the next session, treatment planning, updating treatment plans, thinking about strategy for what kind of intervention I might use or whatever. So that, but your sessions themselves are gonna last 50 minutes. Now, an important thing to know is that this is gonna be in your service agreement. So your service agreement is gonna tell you how long you can expect your sessions to be. Can you go over 50 minutes? It depends. Sometimes therapists will allow you to go say like 90 minutes, but if insurance is only going to cover the first 50 minutes, you may have to pay out of pocket for the remaining 40 at like a prorated rate. But all of this stuff is going to be indicated in your service agreement because insurance has a very hard stop on when you have to stop seeing people. And that is something that you want your therapist to be really good about knowing and having good time boundaries. I start every session on time. If I'm ever gonna be late, even by like two minutes, I will email a client and say, I'm running late, and then I'll make up for it on the back end. That's the other point of the 10 minutes is sometimes you can make up for it on the back end. But uh, you're generally like, your therapist should be watching the time, but you should also watch the time too, and have a sense that the time is coming. Like sometimes people get way too reliant on their therapist to end the sessions you should also be paying attention to the clock. Like if you notice that it's quarter till and you have five minutes left, you might wanna consider whether it's a good idea to disclose something that's gonna be super heavy and gonna have you feeling like crap in five minutes when you are asked out of the room. Uh, we, I very much value my client's time. I want to be on time and I want to end on time because most doctors, as we all know, do a really crappy job of that. So. I don't like to be that kind of vibe, but we are bound by insurance. If you use insurance to have to stop at those minutes, because that's what they reimburse for. And they dictate a lot of what we do. You kind of jumped into this. So I'm just going to add this in there, but, uh, how do you end a therapy session if it's going really well, but almost over? Oh man. Okay. So this is a, it's, it's a, this is a tricky one because we have to end the session at some point. And this is where I believe it's really important for clients to have a general mindfulness about what they're needing from a particular session and to communicate that directly to the therapist. We don't drive the session. If you have something very specific that you wanna talk about and you know that it's gonna take you some time to really unpack that in a session, you should tell your therapist immediately at the beginning of session, I want to talk about this today. Like sometimes we'll start sessions by having a bit of chit chat, like how you doing, how's your day going, how was your week, stuff like that. That's kind of a nice way to just ease your way in. But if you're like, hey, some shit went down this week and I really need to talk about it because it's been on my mind ever since it happened, can we spend the whole session talking about it? That's a really good way to set the precedent for us to jump right in as needed. If you get, if things are flowing and things are going really well, 
I generally like to give clients a heads up of like, hey, just so you know, we've got about 10 minutes left. So if we need to take some time to like, if you're having a particularly tough session, if we need to take some time to like breathe and decompress and get yourself back in a headspace to leave, we can do that. Every once in a while, if we have to go over by a couple minutes, I can spare that. Like, it's not like I'm gonna hard stop at 5.50 and be like, all right, shut up, you're out. Like sometimes it'll bleed over for a minute or two because it's just the way that the conversation is going. But there's all sorts of different ways that therapists will indicate that time is coming up. The only exception to this would be in the, in the case of an emergency, if we have to get involved in some kind of way with a, um, getting intervention, like I'm talking about like really serious, like suicidal intervention or something like that. Like we, if we have to do something of like getting emergency services involved or something like that, that's going to take session over time. Generally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, hang tight. We're going to talk through this. We're going to do what we need to do. I'm going to email my next appointment really quick to let them know that I'm running late. And then we're going to take, we're going to take care of this. That's really the only exception. But if a session's going really well and you you can always say to your therapist, hey, can we meet sooner than next week? Because this is feeling really good and I want to keep this conversation going. Do you have any openings coming up in the next couple of days? There have been many times over the last 10 years where I've saw a person the next day because I had an opening and they wanted to keep the conversation going. But I do think it's very important in the same way it's important for me as a therapist to respect your time as a client. You also should respect your therapist's time. I think that's a really important reciprocal process that happens in therapy in terms of that respect for time because I have other people that are counting on me to show up for them and to be as present with them as I am with you. And we're all trying to work together to make that happen. So I get to I get to ask you a, a fun question. Um, you said therapists don't di drive the session. Uh, would you say that's the case with all therapists? No. No. Oh, God, no. I mean, there are there, there are some therapists that will absolutely take control of the session, which if you need that, that's fine. Uh, my general philosophy on therapy is that you bring the goals and you bring the content and then I bring the expertise to help move it in the direction that you want to go in. But at the end of the day, I'm not the one that's going to say to you, hey, all right, so let's let's go ahead and jump in and talk about your sex life today. Uh, sometimes therapists will do that because they're part of the assessment phase of trying to gather the information they need to get. So early on, sometimes we're going to drive the conversation with more questions because we're trying to get as much info as we can get around what your goals are. But ultimately, if you have something that you really want to talk about, your therapist can't read your mind. So you're the one that needs to bring it in and be clear about what it is that you want. But yeah, there are some schools of therapy that say the therapist is in charge. I tend to be pretty averse to that idea because I think it's a collaborative process. Um, but if you need, which really comes down to, you should always be giving your therapist feedback. Like if you like something they're doing and want them to do more of it, you should tell them that. If your therapist is doing something that you're not particularly fond of or that you don't find helpful, you should tell them that too. You are the customer. You are the consumer of the therapy. Now, your therapist might say, I understand that you don't like that we're talking about this, but here's why I'm, I'm taking us there. Here's how this fits within the context of your treatment plan and your goals. Your therapist should be able to articulate that to you. If you're like, I don't like that you're doing this and your therapist is like, well, and you're like, why are you doing this? And they're like, oh, it just kind of feels like the right thing to do. That's not a good answer. You should always have an answer prepared as a therapist for why it is that you're doing what you're doing or asking the questions that you're asking or intervening in the way that you're intervening. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, it's a collaborative process that I think clients drive more than the therapist does. It's sort of like you hand us what you're wanting to talk about and then we'll take the reins in the direction of like questioning and intervention. So I think this is actually a really good topic to talk about because I, I feel like this might be an instance where your personal philosophy of therapy might not mesh with like all therapists because I totally. definitely well simply just because we know that there are like schools of thought that don't necessarily approach therapy the mm -hmm. way that you do. Uh, but this is another reason why it's good to kind of talk to your therapist a little bit about who they are, kind of feel out for their vibe, yes. feel out how they like to do therapy, because you are going to get some therapists that like they're going to drive the session because you came in and you said, I need help with this. And they said, great, I'm going to take the expert role 
and I'm going to drive this car so that we can, you know, get you the help that you're looking for. Um, and if you don't want that, uh, then you need to be aware of that. Um, cause like, I think the thing that comes to mind, at least for me is if I, I know there are therapists where they can tell when somebody doesn't want to like work on something at a certain point, but they're doing it in more of an avoidant way. And maybe they might probe as to why they're avoiding it, but they're definitely going to try and drive the conversation in the way of the thing that they're avoiding. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason why it's really good. I, I like your, um, uh, your consultation um, tip, uh, just so you can get a better idea of who they are as a therapist. Now, a question that I did have that I didn't ask in here that I think is related. If I were to go to my consultation and my therapist was to say, I'm a narrative therapist, how much research should I as the client then do on narrative therapy? Yeah, it's a fun one, right? Oh, man. Well, first of all, I think if you're if that person says that, you should just ask them what does that mean? Like okay. you you should you should totally ask your therapist what does that mean and how does that affect the way that you approach treatment with your clients? Mm -hmm. Because if you're if your therapist should be able to answer that. Uh like and should be able to answer that to a point that is satisfactory for you. I I don't really believe in having clients go do a bunch of research about treatment protocols. Because uh, you're going to get lost in the weeds and you're going to think that like it's supposed to go a certain way and you don't have the background, context, and education to really understand what that approach is. Now, if you want to know a little bit about the background of it, where it comes from, how it's used, what it's generally considered to be useful for, what people's experiences are for it, sure, Google away, ask your friends, have, you know, go, go check it out. Go find some literature that therapists are using in grad school and read it if you want to. But your therapist should be able to answer what that means. And I think that your your point here with asking your therapist about their approach is super important because the way that I answer that question when people meet with me for consultations is generally, I am whatever you're needing from me. So there are certain cases where I can be very directive. I can tell you exactly what I think you should do. I can run you through a protocol. I have a certain approach, like sports psychology, for example, like there's a certain approach I have with athletes on certain things that I follow. OCD is another one. Like it's a very targeted, very systemic way of working through the OCD. There are other times where if you need me to be a person who just sits there as a warm body in a chair and just listens to what you have to say and goes, uh-huh, that sounds really rough. I can do that too. There are different things that work with different people. So this conversation with your therapist is something that you should have ahead of time so that, and I would argue that if your therapist doesn't know how to answer that question, that's a very bad sign. Like if you're like, how do you, how do you approach stuff? And they go, well, it just depends. Like I, that, I hate that question or I hate that answer. Or they're like, oh, I don't know. It kind of depends on the client. That, that to me is not a satisfactory answer. Maybe it is for you, but I, I personally think that your therapist should be able to articulate that of here's what I generally do. Here's how I see myself. Here's how I see myself relative to what it is that you're saying that you want to talk to me about. Um, it's like, for example, like yes, yeah, just yesterday, I, I have an athlete that I'm working with. And in our consultation, I said, I have a very specific way that I'll work through this issue that you're wanting to go through. And we have done that. And it has been exactly, he said, this is exactly what I want. This is, this is great. And it's a lot of me scaffolding the sessions. There are, the session ahead of that is me being more of a sounding board with somebody I've known for many years. So it just really, it evolves over time as well, but you should absolutely have that conversation with your therapist. Uh, this kind of blends into this question, but I mean, I think we'll probably spend 30 minutes on this next one. So scrap in just cause it's probably one of the more common ones, but how do I know if a therapist is a good fit and when should I consider looking for a new one? Yeah. Uh, I always say in any video I ever make about therapy, whether it's how to find a therapist, what to expect in your first session, any of those videos, which you should check out on the channel if you're interested, is vibes are the most important thing. Like truly, your relationship, we know this from research and we know this just from listening to people's anecdotal experiences, your relationship with your therapist and the vibes matching with your therapist is the most important thing that you could possibly have. Because if you don't feel good in the room, if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel confident talking to this person, 
if you if, if you're just constantly attending to the fact that something feels off that's gonna tank your therapy completely so <clears throat> This is what I look like when I do therapy, to give an example. This is exactly what I look like. I wear my hat backwards. I wear this, this is the background. This is what this is what you see if you're one of my clients. I look this way on my website too, because there are certain people that might see the way that I look and be like, yikes, that's not what I want in a therapist. And there are other people who would look at that and say, that's exactly what I want in a therapist. So. It's so important when you're looking at profiles online and when you're doing these consultations, by the way, you should do a consultation with multiple therapists if you can before you lock yourself into one because you can compare and contrast and see who you felt more comfortable with. Which therapist made you feel as if you wanted to continue talking to them? That's so like versus which ones made it so you felt like you were gonna shut down or that it just didn't feel like it was flowing very well. You gotta evaluate that stuff. Vibes is, a thousand percent the top thing that you need to be paying attention to. That's what's gonna get you through the hard work of therapy. Having that relationship, like when you reach, I usually say to clients, you'll like me for, you'll like me at first. You will like the fact that I empathize, that I ask the right questions, that I steer you, I like you're, you're gonna like our relationship at first. And then inevitably we're gonna hit a point where you're not gonna like me much because I'm gonna poke and I'm, we're gonna prod into some stuff that doesn't feel good. You're maybe not gonna wanna come to the sessions because we're doing some of the hard work. And if you hang in there with me through that, you'll like me again on the other side. And that has been pretty true for the bulk of the years that I've been doing therapy at this point. And I know that my relationship with a lot of the long-term clients I have is the reason that we've been able to get through some of the stumbling blocks of therapy or some of the harder aspects of what it is because there's a trust level there and there's an ability to converse in a way that is comfortable where you're not dreading the session because you don't know what you're gonna say or how you're gonna say it or how your therapist is gonna react or anything like that. So I think that is by far the most important thing. Uh, the other thing is, are you? do you feel as if you're moving in the right direction? Like, do you feel, you're not gonna feel better after every session, by the way. Sometimes the best sessions are the ones that you walk out of feeling kind of crappy. But in general, in the long-term trajectory of your time, do you have a sense that you're moving in the direction that you were hoping to move in when you were starting therapy? And if the answer to that is yes, there's a good chance that that therapist is a good fit. If the answer to that is no, I've stalled out and I've stalled out and I still feel a really strong desire to move in this particular direction. Sometimes that can be indicative that either the therapist isn't the right fit or their approach is not the right fit, in which case you should communicate that to your therapist. But what you should consider looking for a new one is if, first of all, I mean, the, kind of the obvious ones, if your therapist does something unethical uh, and like harms you in any kind of way, you should bail. Uh, that that's a given but sometimes people are like ah i don't know like they seem cool i don't want to hurt their feelings i don't want to do that. my feelings as the therapist are not important as it relates to you making decision about your therapy like if you want to go see somebody else i'm not going to make that your issue and if your therapist does make that an issue then you really should get out because that's not there i'm a professional service i'm not a friend so uh, you should consider looking for a new one if you feel like you're stalled out on your goals and like the interventions and the approach that the therapist is using just really isn't working for you and it doesn't match. If the if you're dreading going to every session because it's, you're just like, I, this isn't useful for me. I feel like I'm just going because I feel bad about not going. That's a really good indicator that you might need to switch therapists. Um, sometimes your needs change and you need a certain type of expertise that your therapist can't provide, in which case your therapist is likely going to have a conversation with you about that. Uh, but you might see, you know, maybe you have a friend who says that they have this really amazing therapist and you want to give that a shot just because you want a fresh set of eyes on your therapy. That's a good reason to do it. Really, any reason is a good enough reason to consider looking for a new therapist if you want to. But the main ones that are the most useful, I should say, are are those but ultimately like it's your your vibes are so important also if your therapist starts kind of hijacking the th sessions with like self-disclosure and stuff and like they st you start feeling like you're attending to your therapist instead of them attending to you that's a pretty big red flag too uh you said you weren't my friend you were my therapist what what do you what do you mean by that so 
there is a level of intimacy that happens in therapy, understandably so, because you are showing up vulnerably. And a therapist is really useful in that case because a therapist does not have an agenda outside of you in terms of like what it is that you're bringing and what it is that you're working toward. Like what I'm doing later tonight or what I'm struggling with in my life is not part of the equation at all. Um, my personal philosophy on life to an extent is not a factor at all here. I'm here in service to you. A therapist is a professional service. We are not friends for hire. So it's also because it's it's one direction. Like you, a lot of, because you're disclosing so much and because there's a vulnerability there, there is a sense that like you're close to that person. And in a way you are, like we're humans. I understand that like your therapist matters to you. But at the end of the day, you are, it is not a bi-directional process where you are, what a friend would be for your therapist. Like Jared is my friend. My clients are not my friend because I don't disclose stuff to them and I don't lean on them for anything and that's not my responsibility. I'm there as their therapist. So I also don't pay you. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, you're, you're paying for the service. Like you're literally, you're buying my time and my expertise. And the sense of connection you feel because the vibes line up is important. It is so important but it's not a friendship. It's not a romantic relationship. It's not, sometimes there is a tendency, and this is not a bad thing, this happens all the time. There's a tendency to feel a sense of intimacy that can feel romantic to an extent, and sometimes clients will even wonder if their therapist is interested in them because of the way that they attend to them, because maybe you're getting the type of attention that you've never gotten before in any kind of relationship, and that feels really good. And that's why we have a code of ethics. It's why we have to be mindful of the power dynamic that exists in therapy, because there is a power dynamic there by virtue of the fact that you are in the vulnerable position and we are in a position of expertise and we are the ones that are responsible for upholding those ethics and acting responsibly. But that intimacy is there. It's just very important to realize that that intimacy exists because the relationship that you're having with your therapist has some bones in it that might be useful for you to find in other relationships in your life. But your therapist is only there really because you are scheduling time with them and you're paying for the service. That's why they're there, uh, unless you're a pro bono client, but in which case still, like you're providing a service. So very important to understand at all times, your therapist is there in service to you, they are not a friend. They can't, like, I can't have drinks with clients. We can't make, we can't have any kind of relationship post therapy. Once, and this is why I made the point about once you sign the service agreement with your therapist, they're your therapist. Because as soon as you do that, we're considered to be essentially your therapist for life, even if you're not seeing us. So if you're like, oh, five years later, my therapist was really cool. Let me, let me hit him up for a beer. We can't say yes to that. Uh, we can never have a romantic relationship with you at any point in time in perpetuity because of that power dynamic, because the relationship itself was built on a false pretense as it relates to what you would be trying to get out of that relationship later on. So you, the reason you feel connected to the therapist is because of the service they're providing, not because of a personal sense of intimacy that you might have found had you met that person outside the context of therapy. Uh, this isn't uh, written out, but I think it's a kind of a good thing to touch on, especially in regard to the one should I consider looking for a new one? Uh, how uh, should I look for a new one? And should I tell the therapist that I am currently seeing? Yes. I cannot emphasize enough. You are not responsible for your therapist's feelings. Obviously, like, you know, you can be kind in the way that you say you want to find a new therapist. You don't have to be an asshole to your therapist, but you're not responsible for whatever sense of being bummed out we are because we are losing you as a client. You are there as your own advocate. If you are currently seeing a therapist and have a service agreement with that therapist, if you request it, that therapist is ethically obligated to assist you in finding a referrals. They're ethically obligated to help you find referrals. They cannot say to you, nope, they can make, they have to make an effort. Now, it could be that your therapist has a hard time finding referrals for you, or maybe they send you some referrals that your scheduling doesn't line up with. 
that's fine. That That is your therapist doing their due diligence in terms of trying to assist you in finding somebody else to work with. But that can be your first stop of, hey, I was actually kind of thinking maybe this isn't working the way that I want. It's not anything personal. It's just not what I'm looking for. I was hoping you could help me find another therapist who maybe you trust who I could give it a chance with. And my answer to that 100% of the time has to be, absolutely, I can do that. Uh, if you would like... Now, I generally recommend that you give your therapist feedback first and ask for if they are able to make an adjustment. Like, if you're like, hey, I would really love it if you gave me more tools and were more, like, we're doing more interventions with me and giving me stuff to take home with me that's concrete for me to do because I don't really like how you're just repeating back what I say or that you're just empathizing with me. Like, I really want to problem solve some of this. Give your therapist an opportunity to attend to that if, for the most part, they're cool and the vibes are good. Because for me, when I get that feedback from clients, my response is always like, okay, yeah, that's awesome. I can totally do that. Or if you ask for something that the therapist is not capable of doing for whatever reason, your therapist can say, that actually doesn't fall within my realm of ability or expertise. So maybe we need to talk about either bringing somebody in for a consult or referring you elsewhere. Um, that's, that's part of it. Now, you don't have to use that resource if you don't want to. What I will say is that if you want to go out on your own and try and find a new therapist and you want to stop seeing your therapist, please, at the very least, shoot your therapist an email and say, I would like to stop seeing you and I would like to close my file. If you do not ghost your therapist, like people ghost their therapist way more than any of us enjoy. And if you do that, you're ghosting somebody who has a responsibility to you in a ethical and like some ways a legal sense, depending on what it is that you're bringing in. And so we're gonna try to chase after you to get contact with you because we need to know that you're okay. So if you want to stop therapy and you don't feel comfortable telling your therapist in person because maybe you just haven't felt safe in the session or whatever, and it's just not doable for you to do that, please just send your therapist an email and say, appreciate the work. I no longer want to work together. I'm going to seek other therapists. Please feel free to close my file. That's all you have to say. And it will make a world of difference because we'll get that email. We might respond and say, thanks for letting me know. I wish you well. And then we'll close your file and we won't bother you. Uh, so just please don't ghost your therapist. That's, that, that's the one request that I would have for anybody watching this. Um, but you are well within your right to go try to find somebody else. Now, something that's important also, a lot of, a lot of, clients don't understand this because you're not really expected to understand this, is we can't double treat as therapists. So if you want to see another therapist and you're actively on my caseload and you go try to find another MFT to work with and you sign a service agreement with them and you start working with them while you're working with me, that puts me and the other therapist in an ethical bind because we cannot double treat the same issue. So at that point, you're going to have to pick because we can't, I, we can't do that. You can have certain therapists work in different specialties and different modalities. So like if you have a specific issue that you're needing to work with, with like an LPC or something like that, that's outside of what we're working with in our, that's okay. If you need to see a psychiatrist in addition to seeing your, your MFT or a social worker, perfectly okay and legitimate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about basically somebody with the same credential working with the same issues is an unethical situation for you to be in. So if that's another reason why you need to communicate this stuff with your therapist if you can, because if that other therapist hears you say, well, yeah, you know, I'm working with Ryan and uh, we've been working on this issue and I'm just kind of testing this out because I, I don't know how well that's going with him. That therapist then has to be like, I can't do that. You're going to have to make a decision here about what you want to do because I can't double treat. You save yourself a very awkward conversation by communicating. Uh, I wanted to ask you for clarification because I think this is important too. Um, so let's say I would no longer like to go to therapy. I've told my therapist that I would like referrals. Uh, that therapist provides me with referrals. Uh, is the therapist then done or do I have to start seeing the next therapist in order for that therapist to fill their ethical obligation of helping me find someone else? No, the therapist is done at that point. Uh, as soon as the therapist gives you the referrals and you close that out, there that's it. 
If you decide not to see the referrals because you either don't trust the referrals your therapist gave you or you can't schedule with them or whatever, that's not your therapist's problem. That that's um, They did their ethical diligence by providing you with referrals. Uh, I had one more question for you. Oh, um, in, in terms of like double treatment, would you, you said same credentials, but would you say it's maybe the same like level of treatment as uh, instead? Because credentials makes it sound, I think a little bit too similar to like a, you say like a, a master's versus like a PhD. Oh yeah, I mean, that's kind of a rule of thumb that I generally use, but really we'd, we'd be more looking at, are you working on the same issue in the same way with a different person? Uh, like for example, let's say I'm working with a couple that's working through infidelity and like the aftermath of that. And we've been working together for like three months. And then that couple decides to go find another MFT and their main goal is to work through the infidelity because maybe they don't like how I'm working through it with them or they want a second opinion on it. That is the problem. Uh, you can't do that. So at that point, it would, you would be better off saying, you know what, Ryan, we wanna stop sessions for now. We're gonna go maybe explore some other options and see how those go. And then I might say, well, if you wanna come back, by all means, let me know. Like that, that's the thing is like, you don't have to be done with your therapist forever just because you stopped seeing them. Like I've had people who took years off and then emailed me and said, hey, I remember talking with you and I really enjoyed working with you on this specific thing. And I would love to start working with you again if you have the openings. Like you can totally do that. So time and space is an important consideration with this as well. Another thing, uh, we don't have to spend too much time on this, but it feels like it's on the other side of the same coin is people sometimes will ask, when can your therapist end sessions? with you uh, because that does happen and it's a very complicated set of scenarios where that is the case the main worry that is usually buried underneath that question is can my therapist refer me out because they don't like me and the answer mm. to that is no um, it's not my responsibility to like everybody that I see in the same way that for like a medical doctor, it's not their responsibility to provide medical care only to people that they care about or like, like you provide medical care to everybody. We are very similar in that regard. Now that said, there are some exceptions to this one being if you act inappropriately as a client, we so that might be something like berating your therapist, like being just a complete asshole to your therapist and not treating them with respect. Um, you know, there are times where people can get angry at us and that's okay. But like being like, I'm talking about being like a total asshole. Uh, if you make sexual advances at your therapist, uh, in, or harass your therapist in uh, that kind of way, that is grounds for us to dismiss, uh, because that's just, we, how I can't work with somebody who's sexually harassing me. That's different than romantic interest in your therapist. If you are, if you have a crush on your therapist, or if you have some level of romantic interest, that's making it hard for you to work in therapy with them, you can disclose that and we're trained with how to deal with that. That's okay. I'm talking about making actual advances like hitting on your therapist uh, or um, sexualizing things, that kind of stuff. That's, that is generally where we're gonna have an issue. Um, those types of things are where if we don't feel safe with you, that, that's another, that doesn't really apply for me because I see people online, but like if you're in person and you, there's the vibes are in such a way that like, it's very obvious you can't do your job because you don't feel safe. Also, if what you're bringing in falls legitimately outside the realm of that therapist's expertise, that is another case where like, I can't treat you for something that I'm not personally able to work with. So for example, like if somebody came in and was diagnosed with schizophrenia and had very severe schizophrenia, that is outside of my realm of expertise. That's not something that I'm gonna be able to work with somebody on. I wasn't trained for that kind of thing. So I'm gonna to need to make a referral in that space to another ther to a therapist or a psychiatrist who has that expertise. So that would be another example of when we would have to end sessions. But your therapist cannot ghost you. They cannot abandon you. It is actually un it is unethical for your therapist to just disappear. If your therapist is going to end sessions with you, they have to tell you and they have to tell you why. 
You have to have a full understanding of why your therapy is being terminated with your therapist. Otherwise, it is called client abandonment, and you can actually file a case, uh, a com ethics complaint against that therapist for abandoning you. And that is why a therapist, if you ghost them, will reach out to you a bunch of times uh, because basically they have to show that they tried to get in contact with you about where you were and uh, what happened in regards to your therapy because mm -hmm. uh, it's it's literally an ethical violation uh on our part yep um so that's why it's good uh you said more words than i probably would have but if you just want to leave therapies like i will no longer be attending therapy please close my, my file that's fine too that's, yep that's that's good yeah you don't have to you don't have to be like oh i'm gonna go see a new one or like oh you know i didn't really feel like it was worth now nah, if you just no. like i'm not coming to therapy anymore close my file it's like cool good enough Got it. good enough good to know yep. Yep. And they may they may follow up on that just because it's very vague, but you've already you've said what you need to say. Yep. The file's closed. Um uh Okay, so I have to see which ones I've closed out of and oh here we go. Um how many clients does a therapist have at one time? Oh man, depends on the therapist. Um I I actively see each week anywhere from sixteen to twenty one clients. Um some weeks I would see I see less than that if I get cancellations or whatever, but really depends. Uh, there are I know therapists that see five people a week, and I know therapists. Now I would argue that this starts to get into the upper echelon of like unethical because I don't really know how you manage to do this, but I've known people that have seen as many as forty in a week. Um, that is to me excessive. Uh, that would be a red flag for me, by the way. If my therapist said they see 40 clients a week, I'd be like, yikes, how do you have the time to, one, take care of yourself, and two, be present for your clients? But that's a Agency personal work, thing. Baby. Yeah. Um, the I would say the standard is of like what would be considered a full caseload is usually right around 25. Like that. That's, I think, kind of the going idea. We actually cap our therapists that work for us at 25. Uh, we will we will only allow our therapists to work to see more than 25 clients a week with like special permission because uh, you need to absolutely take time to take care of yourself and attend to your clients in the in a in the way that they need to be attended to. But Oops. there sometimes there's yeah 25 to 30 you'll see sometimes as being considered like a full caseload. Generally, we will have more cases on our caseload than we have spots during the week because inevitably every week we get cancellations and stuff like that's just part of it uh so usually like i have i have about 29 cases on my caseload but any week is 16 to 21 because i have some people i see every other week i have some people i see monthly i have some people i see as needed i have some people i see weekly i have some people i see twice a week so it really just kind of depends but generally you're gonna i would say that like the most standard thing that you're probably gonna see is anywhere from 15 to 30 clients a week from somebody who's working a full caseload. Mm -mm. All right, and we're gonna go back into the room, or I guess technically this is outside of the room. What should I be doing outside of therapy? Do therapists give homework? Some therapists do, some therapists don't, some therapists give it out sparingly, some people, some therapists give it out all the time. If you want homework, you should tell your therapist. If you mm -hmm. don't want homework, you should tell your therapist, although that one, sometimes we need to give you something to, to do outside of therapy just because it fits within what it is that we're talking about. But what you should be doing outside of therapy is something that you should have a conversation with your therapist about. Because there are some cases where somebody simply asking me that question, I have an answer prepared for them. Here's what I would love to see you do outside of therapy if you were being mindful about it and wanted to implement it on a day-to-day -day basis. I give homework, I would say relatively rarely. Uh, if people specifically request it, I will give it, but it really, again, it just depends on what it is you're working through. I will say this, that unless the intervention calls for it, I generally, this is Ryan's personal philosophy, I generally don't believe in having clients do anything outside the room that I haven't had them do in the room. So, for example, like with a couple, if I want them to have a more vulnerable conversation about something they're struggling with, I'm going to try to facilitate that conversation in the room first before I say, okay, now I want you guys to go home and have this conversation. Unless I'm trying to gather information about what makes that conversation hard to have, in which case I might say, hey, go have this conversation at home and then report back to me next week on how it went. 
because then I'll see if people avoided it or what made it hard or whatever it is. But the work that you should be doing outside of therapy is relative to your goals. It's relative to the treatment plan. And if you want more or less homework, you should communicate with that. You should communicate that with your therapist. And that's really the best way that I can answer that question. I will stress that that is very much a Ryan philosophy thing because you will you'll definitely have therapists that are going to give you the oh yeah to do yeah, yeah. Therapy, you don't go in the room I but another another question that you should have for your therapist though is how much stuff are you going to ask us to do outside of the room versus in it do you give a lot of homework what's your general approach with that kind of thing like that's going to be something like I'm glad that you keep pointing that out because it's incredibly important for people to understand that like we are all very unique in the way that we handle our therapy, particularly the longer you do it. Uh, you mm -hmm. you you become a lot more dynamic in what it is because you start to learn that like different things work for different folks. Like it's not a one size fits all dealio. So I have certain things that I will default to, but I'm not the end all be all of great therapists. Uh, there are plenty of people that wouldn't enjoy working with me in the same way that there are plenty of people that love working with me. That's just how it goes. <clears throat> I would say that you and I are a very, very good example of that because I think one of the reasons why you and I got along so well is because I think our demeanors in the room were very, very similar. And we just enjoyed the way that another person kind of approached clients. But our interventions were very different. <laughs> very different, yes. Just because, like, <laughs> literally, we both like different schools of thought. Mm -hmm. um, so, like you and I could talk to uh, a client the exact same way if they present us with an issue uh, they could we could relate to them or whatever in very very similar ways but then when it came to that end of the session and what we were gonna like how we're we gonna move forward you and I could have been drastically different totally um so I think that's another thing that's kind of important to to know because like I would definitely give homework and I would also sometimes just give like, if you will, odd homework, just because uh, I like the school of strategic therapy, uh, which I think you hate. No, I have a hefty appreciation for it. I just don't use it very often. Okay, you don't hate it. Uh, hang on, Scott, then. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're just very... <laughs> yeah, they're just, we're, we're just really, Hi, really different. <laughs> but like, yeah, like we can get, like the way we get along with each other, like might seem like, oh yeah, these these two dudes vibe real well, but then he might do an intervention. I was like, I would literally never tell somebody to do that. Yep. Because uh, it's just, I wouldn't, I don't know how, like, I guess a way to explain it kind of like in a heady way is the way Ryan might give an intervention and be like, cool, this is going to accomplish this. I might see that same intervention and be like, I have no idea how you're going to get the result out of that intervention. Just because it's not the way that I conceptualize therapy and or human beings. Yep. Um, so like I, I would also not really recommend going too deep into the weeds on some of this stuff. Just because some of the therapeutic approaches are also like just by nature, very, very heady. And the way a therapist conceptualizes some of those things or learned about some of those things could look completely different in the way that they implement them. Yep. There's a concept that I'm sure you probably heard this within your first semester or two of grad school that we heard all the time. It's called equifinality. And for anybody watching this who doesn't know what that term means, it essentially means that you could have multiple paths that lead to the same outcome. So you could have... You could have the same goal and like Jared's saying, I could approach it one way, he could approach it one way, and both could get you where you want to go. So that's the beauty of therapy and that's why we push so hard that you want to find a therapist that you trust and who you feel comfortable opening up to and talking to because the way that they practice is important, but it's not the end all be all of what's going to get you where you want to go because despite me and Jared both at, behaving very differently in therapy, you could essentially accomplish your goals with either one of us. You don't have to be like, well, if I work with Ryan, I wouldn't work with Jared. That's not how it works. Exactly. That can happen, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I do want you to go back to this question though, because I think just because of the way I wrote it, you focused a lot on homework. Yeah. Uh, but I do want you to kind of touch more on what should someone be doing outside of therapy. Okay, so um, 
something that I say frequently to clients is I'm only with you 50 minutes a week. So I used to have a running joke that I was going to make a bobblehead of myself or a fat head of myself so that people could have it like on me on their wall or on their kitchen table so that they would remember that they're working with me when they're at home trying to have interactions and stuff. But I... <sighs> Therapy is not going to solve your issues just because you go. A lot of times people will think that just calling a therapist and sitting in the session with them and hearing what they have to say is enough. Sometimes it is, but rarely that's the case. You are the one that is responsible for living your life outside the context of therapy. So it's a lot easier for me to do my job if you are actively trying to implement some of the things that we're discussing in therapy in your everyday life. So that could be something like as simple as we've now spent, uh, I'll use an example from a conversation I had a couple weeks ago. We've now spent the last four months talking about ways that you can each initiate a conversation about X thing that you feel vulnerable about that's been difficult to talk about. We've had some of these conversations in therapy. One of the things that I'm noticing is that you are both avoiding that topic and you're holding off on it until you get into therapy. You have the skills, you've shown those skills in therapy. When I facilitate this, it goes incredibly well. You have to practice having these conversations when I'm not around. I, I, you, you don't wanna be in a scenario where you're reliant upon me in order to be able to have these conversations. I wanna work myself out of a job on this one. So spend, you know, have the conversation twice this week. Force yourself, schedule it. Force yourselves to have a conversation as if I'm sitting in the room with you this week, even if it's messy, but we have to start that. Uh, if there is like, let's say for example, if I'm working with somebody who's struggling with like OCD and it's really bad and we've come up with all sorts of ways to conceptualize it and things to have to think through and do. If you go out into the world and you continue to act upon the impulses and not implement the stuff we're talking about, it's going to make therapy take a lot longer. So. The work that you should be doing on a therapy in some ways is just understanding that therapy itself is not going to solve your problems. It's the work that you put in with therapy as a catalyst that's going to solve the issues that you're coming in to work with. So just knowing that at the outset and then taking the skills you're learning in therapy and actually doing the hard work and being disciplined about implementing them in the situations that you need to implement them in and not being afraid to be messy with that. You don't have to be perfect with this stuff. It's a learning process, but that's... I think a really important aspect of the work you should be doing outside of therapy. Uh, actually, you touched on something and I made it its own question because I think it's important. Um, what do you mean you want to work yourself out of a job? <laughs> so there is a common myth and misconception that therapists want you to struggle so they can keep working. I can tell you right now that if I had half my caseload drop off my caseload, I would have those spots filled within the next two weeks. There is always going to be somebody who has something they need to talk about and work through. I don't, in, I don't actively hold my clients in their struggles because I wanna get paid by them or their insurance. And a lot of people have this in their head that that's what we want. And it's just not. I don't know a single therapist who has ever said to me in my life, even therapists I would consider to be not particularly great at their job. I've never heard a therapist say to me, yeah, I really want all my caseload to struggle so they keep coming in and paying me. It's just not a thing. So when I say my job is to work myself out of one, what I mean is that I am a, I am a piece of scaffolding for people to accomplish their goals. I'm a mediator. So you come in and there's a certain thing you're struggling with. I provide time and expertise and tools to help you implement these things in your life so that you no longer need me in order to implement those things. I want you to accomplish your goals. I want to provide a service that allows you to get to a point where you can say to yourself, I'm confident having these kinds of vulnerable conversations or 
I, or I thought through this thing and I made a particular decision I was trying to make and I feel good about the way that that process went and I don't need to have a conversation with you now every single time that something comes up with, between me and my mother because I now have the tools that I need in order to set proper boundaries. Like that kind of thing is good. Now, I know I'm saying that in the context of having told everybody an hour ago that my average caseload length is three and a half years. That's not because I'm actively holding people in place. It's because we've solved series of issues throughout our time together. And that sometimes having the relationship um, of just being able to talk through things benignly for maybe months at a time, you have that relationship built up and ready to go for when something does happen where you have to acutely get in there and rehash those skills. Sometimes people will drop off the caseload for a while and then they come back when there's another issue that comes up because they trust in your ability to help them through it and scaffold that process. But my job is to help people accomplish their goals and to see themselves as the ones that are capable of accomplishing them. I'm just an outsider that helps guide you in the right direction and provides a level of expertise and insight that you wouldn't have otherwise had. But I am not the reason that you have accomplished your goals. I could be a big part of it, but I'm not the reason at the end of the day because I'm only with you an hour out of your week. You're the one that has to live all of those other hours. So if you can start doing the things that we're talking about in therapy and it's starting to accomplish the stuff you want to accomplish and it becomes hard to know what to talk about in therapy because you're accomplishing your goals, that's awesome. Like, fly. You, you don't have to stay in therapy just because now, sometimes people will struggle with the idea of terminating and they'll want to stay in therapy and keep talking to their therapist because they provide a level of stability. And that's okay. We have to have a conversation about that because I need to know ethically at every given point in time that I am providing a service to you, that I'm not just a friend for hire or somebody that you're coming in to, be, to use as a sounding board. If you are using me as a sounding board, I have to understand the context under which that fits into a treatment plan in order for me to be able to continue seeing you. So that's where a dialogue between you and your therapist is gonna be really important. But that's what I mean when I say my job is to work myself out of one, and that's every therapist's job. We're not trying to keep you struggling or poke holes in things we don't need to poke holes in just so that your insurance continues to cut us a check every week. That is, the, that is probably the myth about therapy that makes me the most frustrated because I never went into this field for that. I didn't go into this because I want people to struggle. I went into this because I want people to achieve their goals. Yeah, I would say another way for you to kind of look at it, at least from like my perspective, is when it comes to therapy, I personally want to help as many people as i possibly can and i can't mm -hmm. do that if i have the same clients so my goal is to try and help you so that you no longer need me um another i guess more real slash harsh or way of looking at it is again i have clients i don't have friends so like i like i'm not here to hang out with you all the time and keep you around because you're not a friend of mine like this is a working relationship Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I think I run into that myth a little bit less than you do these days, but that myth definitely still exists where it's just like, yeah, your therapist doesn't want you to get better because then they don't have any money. Um, but any, like, I think, I mean, I think I'd be willing to say that, like, 99% of the therapists, especially in our current climate, like, if they need to have clients, they will immediately. Uh, we yeah. are at a severe, like lack of therapists as uh, compared to a lack of clients so you don't really have to worry about um them keeping you there so they can make money therapists are going to make money uh right yeah. now i um, have i have three i had to reduce my weight my wait list from five to three because it the last time i pulled a client off my wait list was like a year and a half ago so like i mean there's just I could have so many people on standby if I needed to. And I mean, it, there's, it's a bit of an odd space right now because there are like, I know for our practice, like our referrals lately have been down. I think just because people are afraid of like economic conditions right now. And mm -hmm. there's um, also June is usually, May, June is sometimes where insurance companies do turnover uh, and people's new plans start. And so the, mm -hmm. that's a whole other thing too, but that's a conversation for a different day. But um ultimately yeah like we're not 
ther therapy is in high demand, especially since we can do online therapy now. It, mm. it, it makes a huge difference in terms of accessibility. So uh, that's now granted, if you need to continue seeing your therapist, keep seeing your therapist. Don't bail off your caseload because you're like, well, somebody else probably needs it more than I do. That's a terrible mm -hmm. reason to end therapy. Like, that's not what we're saying here. Keep seeing your therapist if it's meaningful to you, for you. As long as it's meaningful for you to work with me and you're getting something out of it and it's therapeutic, I'm in. Uh, I'm not gonna shove you off my caseload. And you shouldn't shove yourself off my, your, my caseload just because you want somebody else to have an opportunity to work with me. So, um, yeah, it's just, but yeah, we, we, this is one of those areas where Jared and I share somewhat different philosophies in some ways too, is because I like having a lot of long-term clients on my caseload. I enjoy the consistency of that. I enjoy watching people evolve and grow over that because I love development. So it just gets, it's cool to see that. I like doing short-term work too. Um, and again, as long as it's therapeutic, we're cool. And in my case it is. So it, some, some issues are longer term than others too. Like if you're working with trauma, that's long-term work. If you're working with, you know, how do I ask my date out to prom? That's going to be a lot more short term. I don't hate long term therapy, by the way. No, I know you just I know that you skew more in the direction of wanting to really like. Hammer it out, not hammer it out, but like, like you said, have multiple people that you're working through and help a lot of different people. Yeah, my, my goal is to get in there and get after it pretty much. When yeah, I'm in therapy. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little I more of a slow burn. Yeah, yeah. We just, I mean, it's just by nature of our, like, preferred schools yeah. of thought on that. Which we can do a school of thought Q&A one day, maybe, if you really want to. I did teach the uh, models class, so, yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, speaking of longevity, do I have to go to therapy for the rest of my life, or will there be a point when I can leave? You can leave at any time. <laughs> Unless you're mandated, but, like, you, you can leave at any time. No. Uh, first of all, I sort of I, I I know why you put this question up. I'm sure because you know I'm going to take issue with the language in the question itself, which is, do I have I actually, to go to therapy? Oh, hey man, I I just write what's on the board. Yeah, right? no. So I have to go to therapy. No, you don't. Um, we there's a sort of a I don't know what word to use. There's there's a vibe to that part of the question. It's essentially like, am I slave to therapy forever? It's like, no, you're not. I mean, really, the way that we just answered the previous question, I hope, attends to that portion of it. Yeah. If you want to see a therapist for the rest of your life, go for it. <laughs> like, I, there's plenty of people that see a therapist for decades uh, that have a great experience with that. And that's totally fine. But if you don't want to, don't. <laughs> like, one of the things that is really nice about what we do is I'm not necessary in a like conventional sense. Like I, for some, some clients would say I'm necessary in terms of them achieving their goals and like managing their mental health. But ultimately like, I'm not somebody that anybody's gonna force you to work with. And so if it's not working for you or you're getting tired or fatigued and you just need to take some time off because you're just, you're tired of it, do that. Now, there are some people with chronic mental health issues that make it hard to take time off of therapy. I'm thinking things like chronic depression or trauma or those types of things can make it very difficult to take time off of therapy. And you may be like, I really don't want to go to therapy, but it helps in the same way that people will sometimes handle psychotropic medication. Like they're like, I don't want to take antidepressants, but man, do they help? So I'm going to keep doing it. It can be, so, it can be like that sometimes, but that's where you have a conversation with your therapist about like, Hey, I, I'm just getting tired. This this is a lot of work. And sometimes it means like, all right, let's chill for a bit. We don't have to keep going ham on the issue every single time you come in. Like we can take a couple sessions to just chill. I have sessions sometimes where half the session is talking about sports or video games or something because it's relationship building and because that's what a client needs in order to get back into the right headspace in order to do the work that they need to do. Which is another, I think, myth about therapy is that you're doing hard work all the time. It, no, you're not. Like, there are there are many times where we are spending time chit-chatting. I laugh all the time in therapy, by the way. Like, we, 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 I crack jokes with clients. We laugh about stuff. We, we talk about things that are ridiculous that happen over the course of the week. Like, it's not always 
sit down, shut up, do the work, and get out. I, I, that would kill me if I had to do that. I, I prefer therapy as being a human experience. So if you're getting tired of that part of it, you should you should talk to your therapist about that and see if there's any adjustments that could be made so that you feel more comfortable and less like you're having to do this for the rest of your life. Yeah, some of the best progress can be made when you're doing some of that joining. I mean, it's just like a normal conversation, really. Like people, people feel better when it seems like the other person has a genuine interest in them. Uh, and so if you, and also it's just, I mean, you think of, uh, about it from like a, like a holistic standpoint, you, if you know more about the person that you're working with, you might be able to approach it from different avenues. So if I know about the things that you enjoy doing or the things that like make you, you, it will ultimately make the therapeutic experience in general better. Oh, and when you can do like callbacks to stuff and yeah, like metaphors that really just grab a person, that kind of stuff is, that's the, the, that's to me the fun part of therapy too. It's like, oh my God, you remember that from three years ago? Like, yeah, you know, like that was crazy when that went down and you made this offhanded remark about it. And they're like, wow, that's cool that you were listening. Like that kind of stuff is, I think, uh, a lot of uh, fun as a really, like therapy, that fun is kind of a, I think sometimes people, feel weird when they hear the word fun as it relates to therapy, but like therapy can be an enjoyable experience uh, for, yeah. like, I love my job. I love, I love the, the, the 16 to 21 hours a week that I'm seeing clients. I really enjoy it. And there are times where it's difficult. There are times where sessions are hard or something that really heavy happens. But for the most part, like I love working with the, with all the folks that I work with. It's an enjoyable experience. And to add to your point about like the relationship building part of it, particularly with like, I'm thinking about trauma, for example, because I've worked with a, a lot, actually I've worked with a lot more trauma in my career than I thought I was going to. I don't mm -hmm. advertise as being a trauma therapist, but it's found its <clears throat> way to my caseload quite a bit. As it does, I think most people. As it does for most people. You yeah. Know, everywhere. And one of the things that I reiterate a lot of times to clients that have experienced significant amounts of trauma is that the consistency and reliability of our relationship and our time together is in and of itself a reparative aspect of trauma work. Like having that stability of a relationship that maybe you don't have in other areas of your life as a springboard for being able to get into some of that vulnerability and knowing that that person is available to you on a consistent basis where I know on Wednesday at three o'clock, I'm gonna see my therapist. And even if we don't talk about trauma, I get to see that person and relate to them in a meaningful way and build this like long-term relationship of trust with them. That goes sometimes even farther than any of the interventions that we're gonna do. So that's how dynamic what we do is. It's not all just Solve problem, solve problem, solve problem, solve problem. Actually, I have a question for you. It's it's going to be related to a previous one, but uh, kind of the way you talked about that made me think about it. So if I were to... Oh, I don't want to phrase this question. How much control do therapists have over what comes into their caseload? I guess is my question. Uh, it's a good, okay, it's a good question some but not unilateral power uh so what i used to actually t i tried to teach this to a lot of supervisees and i and i facilitate this with like our associates and stuff is you can advertise how you advertise yourself as a therapist is incredibly important because that's going to draw certain people uh, but you can't avoid things so uh, unless it's outside of your realm of expertise. But like, for example, a personal example that I use, I personally do not particularly enjoy working with substance abuse. Um, that is a one that has been, it's it's not that I can't, it's not that I won't, it's not that I you know, don't know how. It's just not my favorite thing to work with. But I can't actively turn people down if they say that some form of substance abuse is part of the issue that they're having, depending on the substance and depending on the issue. Now, I don't have to put substance abuse in my profile. I don't have to say I work with all sorts of issues, including substance abuse. I don't have to make it part of my drop down on my Psychology Today profile, 
Because if a person puts that in as something that they're actively looking for as part of their main goal of therapy, then I'm not going to pop up. But if a person finds my profile and says, man, that guy seems like a dude I really want to work with and connect with. He doesn't have substance abuse listed here, but it's part of what I'm dealing with, but I'm going to reach out to him anyway. I can't turn that person down for that reason. Now, I might not have room in my schedule. I may, you know, there may be any number of reasons why I can't work with that person, but that specific reason is not an okay reason for me to turn somebody down. But I do believe it's important for therapists to be succinct in what it is that they really would enjoy working with or would like to work with so that you have a very targeted profile. Like I think it's a, I don't, wouldn't call it a red flag, but it's certainly orange. Like if you go on psychology today and you see a profile where literally every single issue from the drop down is selected, I think that's, I don't think that's good. I think that's a person just trying to tick all the boxes so they can get any clients that they could possibly get. I think it's important to really think through what it is that you're wanting to work through and can be more present with. And so I put things like OCD and performance anxiety and severe anxiety, depression, like things like that are gonna be things that I am actively trying to build into my caseload, but I don't get to control that 100% and say I'm only working with OCD and that's it. That's just not, that's not how it works. So if you and I have our consultation call and I call you up and I say, hey man, I just, I really need somebody to help me with my substance abuse. What is your response to that? My response to that is gonna be, that is not a specific area of expertise of mine. I know how to work with that. If that's the sole driver of what it is that you're working with, there may be better options out there for you than me, but I'm happy to take a look at it and see if we're a good fit and try to work through it to the extent that I am capable of. Just know that if it reaches a point where it extends beyond my expertise, I may have to suggest referrals to you because it's not something that I am actively, I'm not a CADC, I'm not somebody who actively works with substance abuse as the sole issue. So if you're okay with that and that's, and you would much rather connect with me because you like the vibe and you're willing to give that a shot, I can do that. Um, just know that that's potentially on the table that I may have to refer you if it doesn't work out. Perfect, there you go. All right, that's what I was looking for. Uh, I got a very fun one for, oh wait, no, should I? No, I'm gonna end on that one. I'm gonna end on that one. Okay. Uh, I like that one a lot. By the way, um, shout out to everybody who's here. I really appreciate y'all watching these videos and supporting them. If you like the video and you're engaged with it and it's helpful to you in some kind of way, please take a moment to leave a thumbs up and also leave a comment. Your engagement helps these videos hit the algorithm and it helps more people benefit from them. So whether you're here live on Twitch or whether you are watching this via YouTube, thank you very much for taking the time to... I hope that our answers to these questions are helpful. And if you ever want to ask questions to me in one of these Q&As in the future, Please make sure you hop into the Discord and use the channel that we have designated for it. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of the questions you actually answered in some way or the other, so it might be rehashing, but here's a new one for you. How do therapists prep for an upcoming session? Let's like really dive into that one. I think this is, I, this is one I want to hear you answer too, because I think it's important for people to hear kind of a diverse range of how this happens because everybody's different. Yeah. Um. So one thing I actually, it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Every night before I go to bed, as like a ritual, I go through the list of who I'm going to see the next day. So I will be like, I'm going to see X. So X person at two, three, four, five. Uh, and that's what my that's what my caseload looks like tomorrow. And I will just take a second and s sort of think through like, okay, what was our last session about? Cool. Then next. And I just I go through the list. And so uh, that way, when I... When I, I'm just kind of in a mindset of I know who I'm going to see the next day. My caseload is pretty consistent. So like my Monday, Tuesdays, and Fridays, like I pretty much know what I'm going to have on a given week. But I think about that a lot. And then prior to like my day, I usually, you know, like I eat and I do all that stuff and I do what I got to do to take care of myself. And then I try to move my body between sessions. So I will like to prep for a session like sometimes I'll re I have a I'm lucky enough to have a pretty good memory so I don't have to review my notes very often but I will like get up and I'll like walk around my house sometimes I'll go like give my wife a hug I might walk outside and get the mail or something like that and I'll think through like all right what's coming up what did we talk about last time is there anything important that I need to remember uh did I do I need to do I need to check my notes and then I will Come back in, I'll usually grab another beverage. I might eat something and then I'll sit down and I will 
pull up the video session and then I send the email and the person pops in and boom. Sometimes I'll grab my phone and I'll check Reddit and I'll just completely disengage for five, 10 minutes and just focus on something else. Or I might respond to some Discord messages that Jared and Sean sent, or I might, you know, whatever. There's any number of things that I'll do. It just kind of depends on where I'm at after a given session. But a lot of it is just thinking through like, all right, like what's coming up? And is there anything important that I need to remember? And let's see what happens. Let's see what they give me. Cause I have the benefit of essentially knowing everybody in my caseload for a long time. So it's not one of those things where like, I'm trying to remember things and I'm thinking like, what do I have to assess this time or anything like that? A lot of it is like, let's see what they bring me today. Because there's like, it's sort of like a, um, I forget, you might know the official term for this, but I think of it as like a, it's like those TV shows where there are some long-term threads, but it's not completely serialized. So like, um, like Seinfeld, like where you might have like every episode is kind of its own unique thing, but there are some general long-term threads that go through it. Like I think about therapy sometimes being that way, where like we have our long-term storylines that we're attending to in a given time, but like every week might have some uniqueness to it built around that, that sometimes is related and sometimes isn't. And so that's just kind of like, I just know that that's coming. So I just am like, all right, we'll see what we get today. And we'll see how close it is to some of the longer term goals or if it's a short term thing that we need to deal with. Here's a fun question. Has that process changed over time? Oh, yeah. When I was a student, I used to think about it constantly. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Like when you're when you're a student. So, you, so here's the thing. I truly believe that as you develop as a therapist, you progressively realize how little you matter. So like when you're an early starting out therapist, because that's that's what you want to do for your career and you're super like engaged with it and you're excited about it, you completely overestimate how much you matter to people. Like you assume that you are like that it like that that 50 minutes is the most important 50 minutes for that person. And that like you and you think about your clients all the time and you think about how helpful you want to be like, oh, yeah, 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 it's like a whole thing. And then as time goes on, you start to realize that like the other hours of the week are as if not more important and that you only occupy a small section of a person or people's week. And it's an important thing. But I don't spend every waking hour thinking about my clients in a way that I might have when I was a student. Um, I, you know, granted, I learned a little bit through working on the suicide hotline how to shut that off prior to being a master's student. But yeah, I think as time goes on, it's not that my, it's not that I don't think about my clients, it's not that I don't care about them, but like I do shut that part of my brain off when I sign out for the day and I go make dinner or I stream or I do whatever. I'm, I'm not thinking about clients. If I am thinking about a client outside of the context of like my work time, it probably means either I've got some counter transferring go transference going on, which is basically like I have some personal stuff that's affecting the way that I'm seeing what a client is doing, or maybe that client is just in need of some extra attention right now and I have to really think through the treatment planning around it. But um, I don't spend huge amounts of time thinking about clients outside of the time I have designated to but yeah, as a student, are you kidding me? <laughs> I spend more time thinking about insurance right now than I do thinking about uh, anything else because they're just such a pain in the ass to work with. Uh, so uh, I'll answer this question because you wanted me to answer it, but I'll be fully transparent in that I don't currently practice and I haven't practiced for a very, very long time. So my answer goes back to literally years ago uh, when I was practicing, and I'm sure this will change over time as I... Uh, do start to practice uh but i was similar in that my understanding of kind of what you just said and how little we matter came pretty quick uh just because i my introduction to therapy was like rather intense from the get-go uh and so i was putting out a lot of fires if you will um on like a pretty consistent basis um so i learned a lot that if i if i have to if i prepare like i can over prepare basically um and that i could be like all right 
we talked about this in the last session. This is what we're going to do in this session. I'm going to try to use this intervention today. Uh, and then if that intervention doesn't work, I have a backup plan, but we're going to focus on this specific issue. And then I would get in the room and then they would come in and just have something completely different to talk about. And uh, all that preparation that I did didn't mean anything. And it was a uh, it was like some time spent that I could have spent otherwise. So I started taking more of a general approach and I also started realizing that like you you do have to let therapy uh, kind of guide you a little bit. Um, and you know, as you do more therapy, as you gain more skills and stuff like that, you get the ability to, to do the different things that you want to do. Um, but I, I too used to be like really meticulous uh, in my approach just because that's typically the kind of person uh, that I am like I'll I'll wait like six months to buy a trash can because I was looking I was reading reviews about different trash cans about how they hold up and how expensive bags are and whether or not the bags have ripped. He's not people lying. Found out. Yeah, like that's like that's how I approach like life in general. And I learned very very quickly that that approach to therapy is a very easy way to burn yourself out too fast. Yep. Um. So I too would start taking a general approach. The thing that I would do is um i tend to do this like after sessions or when my day was over is if somebody told me something or somebody talked about a concept or something like that that i had never ever heard of then i'm gonna dive deep into that um like what's a really good example i can give you um i don't actually know i'm not even gonna give you a specific example oh uh, uh, i'll give you an example like this like if somebody told me that they were um really into like antiques and antique shows and there's like a very very specific aspect of antique shows that was giving them a bunch of trouble then i'm gonna look into antique shows like uh yeah. how auctioneers talk uh what different auctioneers mean what it takes to get into an antique show and all that stuff so that i can understand and try to get into the shoes of that person and understand a little bit more about uh the stresses or whatever that they might go through and it's also another really really awesome opportunity to join with a client because you're like hey so you talked about this i went did some of my own research did i i found this is that right like is this actually how it goes is it different at your at your auctions or getting your antiques or whatever um so like that is a way that i would prepare uh rather consistently with clients like if they brought up something um that i just wasn't used to like i would imagine i'm already pretty well versed in this but like if somebody came to me and it was like video games are a huge part of my life, I play a lot of Elder Scrolls, then I would go home and be like, okay, what's Elder Scrolls? Well, actually, no, I don't know every game in the world, so I, I did do that with other games. Uh, I would go and be like, okay, what are, what's Elder Scrolls? What are you doing it? How do you play it? What type of game is it? So that I could like go in there and be like, all right, cool. Now I know a little bit more about your experience. Tell me what's actually real with it and how it relates, and then we can just move on from there. But like that was a really big part of my preparation process was taking the things that people presented to me and making sure that I wasn't an expert in them, but I at least could relate to them on some level and know them better. That can include consulting with other therapists also, by the way, like you don't have to oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, disclose. Yeah. Like you don't have to disclose uh, identifying information in order to do that. I can't even tell you how many times when I was at Northwestern, I had people approach me about video game stuff. Like yeah. the amount of times that people be like, oh man, I got a client that plays X game. Does that mean anything or whatever? Like that kind of thing happens all the time. And so there were, there were, and there were colleagues that I would consult on different things and different issues and say like, well, you know, Hey, what do you, what do you think about this? And how might I consider working with this and that kind of thing? It's a really, therapists do talk to each other, but we don't, we don't disclose identifying information to each other. Like my wife and I literally, own the practice together and my wife doesn't know who my clients are and I don't know who hers are. Um, and in that way, like sometimes therapy is kind of a lonely experience because we don't share our stuff. Like we don't share a lot of specifics about what we do because of HIPAA. And uh, so sometimes the opportunity to consult with other therapists about these types of things is cool and can be a really helpful way to prep for what we're gonna deal with as well. Actually, like you making that point made me Cause I just like I didn't even, I just thought about it as I just thought about it as like answering your question, but I guess it could be collaboration. But like I went to school in Oregon. Uh, there are not a lot of black folks in Oregon, so whenever people would see other black folks, I got a lot of questions. They're like, "Hey, I don't know anything about this. What's <laughs> going on here?" And like for me, that was just like helping out a colleague. But like, yeah, I guess that is also 
Yeah. A form of collaboration. I just didn't think of it that way. It's kind of you just, it's kind of just like second nature. Honestly, you just do it. That's yeah, just how it totally. Works. Yeah, everybody. That's one of the has... reasons why working in a group practice is so awesome. Totally. Totally. Yeah, being able to like chat with people and have that kind of community is helpful. Uh, I also am not a fan of group practices that mandate that kind of shit. It's, uh, <laughs> but uh, we are very hands off in that way. But it's. Uh, oh yeah, I guess I, I didn't have that. I didn't have that mandated in my inter or my externship actually. No, like it was literally just like a. I guess open office would be the best way to put it. But like, there's literally just like a like a, a lunch room, and there was a room where you just went in the back and like did your notes. But there weren't like cubicles or anything like that. So yeah, it really was just like a really big kind of collaborative space. But it, we didn't have like a weekly group uh, meetup. <laughs> the only time that happened was for um, like our practicum, where I would talk to other folks in my cohort about uh, our caseload, which is um, something that you can. I mean. I don't, you did that for a little bit after grad school, didn't you? Or what did you consult with my cohort? No, not with your cohort. With like, like, like a, like a practicum, like a professional practicum. Uh, uh sort of. We had consultation sort of. groups when I was at Northwestern that we would groups, sit in, that's what I was for. and uh, but they were they were like themed in a particular mm. type of way. So like we had a uh, the one that I sat in on was the uh, IST consult, which is the integrative systemic therapy consult. And so like the people who developed IST were in that group. And then there were some other people that were really interested in it. And so we would take case consultation and we would specifically view cases through an IST perspective. So like we had that kind of thing as opposed to just everybody just popcorn it, which was kind of cool. From, a, from like a therapist perspective, that might be the nerdiest thing you've ever told me you've done. I mean, I had to, uh, and also I, uh, <laughs> I was, I mean, at the time, I guess I was somewhat considered to be an expert in IST. I would still argue that I am, but I, uh, I know you loved it. <laughs> I, well, but I, yes and no. I mean, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of consult groups. Uh, I really? don't, yeah, no, I do, I do not personally enjoy being in a lateral space. Uh, with um, like other therapists talking about it. I like supervising because I like the developmental aspect of it. And I like, mm. I like being more in a position where you're facilitating a person's thought process as opposed to being in consult groups where in general, the people in those groups know what they're doing. And then you get into this kind of like weird nuance around stuff. And I, there's, I don't know. There, my experience in consultation groups throughout my career is generally that I don't enjoy them. So Damn, I, I thought that would have been like a development dream uh, for you. No, I loved doing like I did it. I did a like an IST consult group for students, and I would do I would do stuff like that. I very much preferred that to being with fellow therapists. I. You're probably going to understand this. I tend to find fellow therapists annoying. So I don't like to occupy spaces where there are a lot of therapists around. So that's not an indictment on anybody specific, if anybody in my past is watching this video, but like I just generally don't like sharing space with a lot of therapists. So I, that in a lot of ways is um, why I was averse to that as well, so. No, I totally, I get that for sure. <laughs> I know you I, understand why, but it's just. <laughs> I mean, some therapists don't know how to leave therapy. Uh, yeah, I guess is the way <laughs> to put it. Whereas, like you and I, one of the reasons, another reason why we got along so well is because, like, if we needed to talk about therapy, we could talk about it. But yeah. if we needed to completely throw that aspect of our lives like out the window for a little bit, we could easy. And yeah. that is not the case, especially with like some hardcore it's really hard for phds which blows my mind because like that whole process is so super not yeah. great that i would try and forget about it every moment i could <laughs> yeah yeah it's pretty rough they would want to stay in it i'm like why does, why does this not hurt you <laughs> can i just play destiny <laughs> like, yeah like yeah, literally dude. like yeah like, i don't <laughs> i don't want to talk about strategic concepts in the comfort of my apartment like i already have a bunch of papers and homework i have to do why can you not turn this off 
Yeah, um, I also generally find um, this is a, I don't want to go too off on a tangent on this, but in my in my experience, uh, there is a tendency for like seasoned therapists to be pretty defensive about their work. And yeah. there, there's yeah. there's not a lot of because um, here's it like when you're in consult groups. I don't know how interesting this is going to be for the viewership, but like when you're in consult groups, you're generally with people who they're licensed and they know what they're doing. So like you're you have a general idea of like what you're accomplishing and what interventions you're using and all this sort of stuff. So when you get into consult, usually the place that a person is stuck and wanting consultation about requires way more context than you have time to be able to provide in mm. the th in the consult group. And so then what happens is people start asking certain questions to try to gather that information. And there's this very weird vibe that happens around it because then people will give suggestions and then you get a lot of yeah, buts because that person has been dealing with this for a long time. And I just, that vibe for me was always very annoying. Like one of the things that I enjoyed in the few times that you and I would talk about cases and stuff is that like, you don't do that. And I try not to do that. Like in terms of getting like really defensive about like what I'm doing is the right way to do it where it's like, if I'm going to ask a question about something or seek consultation, I am genuinely open to what it is that people have to say about it. But I also don't open myself up to that as often because generally I feel good about what I'm doing. So there's just this very weird dynamic that happens in consult groups. Um, it's not a red flag if your therapist is in a consult group. Like for the sake of the, of the viewership here, like I could argue it's a good thing if your therapist is in consult groups. It's not because they're lacking. It's because they're wanting additional eyeballs on some of the stuff that they're dealing with or they want some clarity on some things or they want other perspectives and that can be really helpful and sometimes your therapy can actually benefit significantly from the fact that your therapist is engaging in consult in the same way that it might if they're reading research or something like that uh that actually reminded me of another thing that we didn't talk about at all especially in terms of like training or i guess potentially could even relate to prep is do you want to talk to people about ce's uh, I don't know. I mean, I'll give a very brief thing, but I don't know that it's that yeah. important. So we have to take what are called continuing education units in order to maintain our license. Different states have different requirements for it. Some of it's bullshit, to be completely honest. Some of it is legit. It kind of comes down to how engaged a therapist wants to be with the CEUs. Uh, but generally what we have to do is that in Nevada, there are certain categories of hours that you have to fit within the specific categories. So like you have to do X amount of hours in ethics training, X amount of hours in uh, like suicide assessment and risk, like there's all sorts of stuff. And then you get like updated information about that stuff, updated laws and protocols and all these sorts of things. And it's a good thing. Like we should have to do that. And then you have like Illinois, that's just like, just send us your hours do, do study what you want so like it's very it's different states are different but your therapist in order to maintain their license like my license gets renewed every two years in illinois and in nevada and i have to show proof that i engaged in these continuing education units so we are constantly having to engage in these things throughout now most therapists will cram those about two yeah. months before their license is up to expire but you're still getting the information you're still having to engage with it so but yeah that's something that we do yeah i i would agree that the process of ceus it could uh, be better it could be a lot better but i do think that it is still important for like a, a consumer of therapy to know that that is a requirement of it also if you're somebody who wants to like become a therapist this is something you should know um that it that is a requirement of therapists to maintain their license uh is that you do have to go through these continuing education credits and some of them can actually be like really awesome um, i took stuff. one about how to run a practice that's online only and it was amazing it was so helpful with like me trying to figure some stuff out so yes mm -hmm. yeah so they're not they're not all bullshit but it's definitely a process that could maybe be looked at yeah uh, is what i will say to that <laughs> yeah. um uh we had a question come up that i i think is a good one it kind of relates to what we we're talking about here but should people be wary of a service agreement that gives multiple people access to your case or is it generally understood that everybody is a professional and extra eyes are for your benefit 
Uh, I wouldn't call. I wouldn't say be wary of that. I would say check in with your level of comfort with what it is that you're reading. So, in a training context, so so here's so. I will say this. Generally, the less you are paying for your therapy, mm. the more eyeballs are going to be on it. Mm -hmm. So. If you're seeing a student for $2 a session, there's gonna be lots of eyeballs on that. There's gonna be uh, probably a group supervisor, an individual supervisor, the supervision group. All this is gonna be outlined in the service agreement, but you're gonna have a lot of eyeballs on it because it's for training purposes. You go to a training facility, that's part of the gig. Uh, and honestly, it's a good thing. I, I, I really don't see anything bad about it. Um, it it's a good thing. The farther up you go towards like private practice, the less eyeballs. You're, nobody sees my caseload. I like literally nobody sees anything about my caseload. I don't have tape. I don't have audio. I don't share my notes with anybody. I like literally my caseload is completely isolated out. Kind of comes down to your level of comfort on that. But I generally would not say that it's something you have to be wary of because a practice that's acting, I mean, legally and ethically, has to maintain HIPAA standards on that in terms of like their storage of it, in terms of who sees it. Also, if there's ever a breach in that confidentiality, they have to disclose it to you. Um, so, but no, I mean, you can generally expect that people are going to uphold a good standard of ethics because we can get in huge trouble if we don't. So, now, do you run more risk the more eyeballs you have on somebody slipping up at some point? Yes, I think that's a re that's a reality. Like the only way anybody finds anything out about my caseload is if I slip. I don't have to worry about anything else. But that's where you are checking in with the standards of practice. This is where you're asking questions. Like literally, if you have a question about the way that your therapy runs or how your therapist runs, how the practice runs, any of the protocol, any of this stuff, you should ask. You should always ask if you have a question. You, there is no such thing as a stupid question. None of your questions should be offensive at all to your to your therapist. They, they should answer that. You could even ask, have you guys ever had any breaches of confidentiality? And if so, what did you do? How did you handle it? Like, if you could ask that. And if you asked that to me, I'd say, nope. Uh, I will tell you that we once had somebody in my master's program had her car broken into and had some case notes on her laptop that was stolen from her bag. And that was something that had to get handled with the clients that were on her caseload. Um, but that kind of thing happens so rarely. In all my years, that's the only time I've ever heard of something like that happening. So it's... Uh, Which is also a scenario that I actually had brought up specifically, not obviously of your person, because I didn't know who they were. But like I had that specific scenario brought up in my ethics class so that my ethics professor let me know that's my fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like she got in huge trouble for that because one, she also violated protocol by having notes not yeah. encrypted and available on her laptop to be accessible by anybody who could access the laptop. So like that that's on you and you can get in big ass trouble for that. You have to stand before an ethics committee and all that fun stuff. By the way, if anybody's interested in how that works, just very briefly, if you file an ethics complaint against your therapist with the state, which the state is who you file it with. There's an ethics committee for every state, for every license. When you file that complaint, they will uh, provide you instructions for what you, what you need to provide to them in order to substantiate your claim. And then they will notify the therapist, usually anonymously, that they have been accused of an ethics violation. And then that therapist is given an opportunity to respond to that complaint. And then the committee will determine whether it's a case that they're either going to throw out or pursue. And if the committee decides that they're going to pursue that case, they will then go to the therapist and request a ton of documentation uh, for them to try to prove essentially their innocence around this. And they may have to attend certain hearings and there's all sorts of stuff that they're gonna have to, to deal with. And sometimes people get through that process and the committee says, all right, not great, but also not terrible. So here's like kind of a slap on the wrist and be more careful. Sometimes people lose their license. It can really depend. But if you are ever worried that you are, uh, that 
that your therapist has violated something ethically, you can always reach out to the ethics committee and ask. And they may tell you like, no, that's not really anything that we would pursue. They may also tell you like, yeah, create a claim and here's the information we need from you. Um, but it's not one of these things where like you're, you're total, it's not a David and Goliath situation. Like the ethics committee is there to ensure that everybody that's licensed in the state is acting in correspondence with ethics. They don't know that somebody has acted unethically unless they are notified about it. So uh, you let them do the investigation on that. You just provide what it is that happened to you. And they usually do a pretty good job of catching that stuff. So HIPAA is a whole uh, other level. You violate HIPAA, you're screwed. But um, I guess the point of not clarification, but a question I have is <clears throat> if you think that your claim is not going to go anywhere, should you just go ahead and not file it? I would generally recommend either reaching out to the committee and asking questions about it, or you could also reach out potentially to a lawyer for a consult on it, and they could tell you whether it's... There are lawyers that specifically work in, like, licensing and professional regulation, and they will generally offer free consultations on that kind of thing, too, where you can say, this thing happened with my therapist. Is this something that I should file a complaint with? But I don't generally, like... Th th if you think that your therapist violated something ethically you can feel that um it's a lot different than just kind of like oh therapy's hard lately uh and so reaching out for consultation from people is totally okay you might even have a conversation with your therapist depending on what it is but uh, i generally recommend reaching out for consultation on that kind of thing all right you want to do one more you want to lock it down no you can give me the if you want to give me that fun one go for <laughs> it but i am a hard out at three so we got six minutes to do it but I go to therapy even if I don't need it. <laughs> I didn't see this one. Uh, uh, oh, man. Oh, there's so many layers to this. Because um, need is the needs the operative term here. Um, mm -hmm. I could argue that anybody could benefit from therapy anybody could benefit from it. So if there is something that's going on in your life that you're struggling with, that you want somebody to give their undivided attention to you for X amount of hours, for X amount of weeks, so that you can sort it out, that's a good enough reason to go. I, I always say on stream, any reason's a good enough reason to go to therapy. If you have no idea why you would go and you think it would be pointless to go, I don't know why you would go. Uh, I don't know that I, I don't know that like, let's just see how it is, is a great idea, but you could do that. Um, there are people that will do that. Say like, you know, I don't really know exactly what I want to talk about, but my friends have been talking up therapy and said it's really helpful for them. And I wanted to give it a shot. I mean, we are, tr we know how to handle those types of things if they come across our table in terms of how to facilitate a conversation and to figure out whether therapy would be useful for you. And again, that's where a consultation is going to be helpful. But the idea that therapy is something that should only be accessed when you need it is, I think, a bit misguided. Therapy is something that you could access at any time for any reason if it's something that you believe that we would benefit from going to. And I would also argue that, like, it is worthwhile to go to therapy for things preemptively rather than reactively. Uh, the amount of time, I use the cancer metaphor for this because a lot of time, I would say probably 90% of the time people approach us when they're at stage four and or stage three, like basically like shit's really hit the fan and they've tried every coping strategy they know of and they've run out of ideas and they're on their last rope as opposed to people saying something like we're getting ready to start having a child for the first time and we want to go to therapy to be properly prepared for that process or something like that. That's that's the best when you're preemptive about it and you're actually thinking through your life and your struggles and are like, huh, I could really benefit from having somebody really guide us through this in a meaningful way so we do it right ahead of time, so we measure twice and cut once. And so that, I think, is a worthwhile reason to go. But if you think that therapy could be of benefit to you for some reason, give it a shot. 
And there are affordable options out there. I can just hear people watching this right now that are like, I can't afford it, so I'm not gonna deal with it. There are affordable options out there. I encourage you to watch my How to Find a Therapist video that's out on YouTube because I talk through that aspect of it. You can always ask a therapist if they have any pro bono slash free slots available. Worst they can say is no. Best they can say is I do actually. And there's also therapists who are willing to work on sliding scale where you pay what you afford, can afford. There are also like community agencies that are available that are more affordable. Like there are options out there that are affordable that I encourage people to check out. Don't just assume that it's not out there for you and then stop yourself ahead of time. Give it a give it the old college try to see what's out there. The other thing with the advent of online therapy being more available is you don't have to see somebody that's in close proximity to you in the state that you occupy. If you live in rural West Virginia, you could talk to somebody online in Charleston. Like there's all sorts of I don't know why West Virginia is the example. I came why up wouldn't with, you but just I, use Nevada? I don't know. If you live in rural ass Nevada, you can find somebody in Vegas. I don't know. It's whatever. I was trying to be more relatable to the to find folks that aren't in Nevada out here. Uh, but whatever, you get my point. But the, any reason, if you think that therapy could be a benefit to you, you should go. That's how I'm going to answer that question. Uh, okay, you you did a good job answering that question, I think. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, feel free, to, feel free to wrap this up, buddy. All right, YouTube, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. If there are questions that you would like to ask, you can certainly ask them in the comments. We might pull them from the comments for a future episode. If this is something that you would like to see a part two on because maybe it didn't touch something that you would have liked for it to have touched on, please let us know. Your engagement in the comments on these really helps drive whether we do a sequel or whether we move on to something else. I do hope that mine and Jared's answers were meaningful to you in some way that you learned a little bit of something about therapy that maybe it helps you feel more comfortable about some aspect of therapy that you weren't sure about. We try to be as comprehensive as we can in these Q and A's despite the limited time. But if you want a part two, please let us know and we will look into doing that. Check out the other Q and A's that we have available on YouTube. Check out the other videos that are on my channel, not just my playthroughs. We also have educational resources available to you. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and supporting what we do. We really enjoy it and we will be back. We try to do these monthly, so come hang out with us on Twitch sometime while we're doing it live. We'd love to have you. And pop into Discord and ask your questions there and check all the other links in the description. Thumbs up, comment, follow the links. We'll see you in the next one.